Trish, you and Dave, come on up. We'll relieve you of welcoming duties. What? Okay. I know what that finger means. <laughs> well, how dare you? Hold on. If she starts calling me Charles Roy, I, know, I really know what that means. Yeah. <laughs> that means hello. <laughs> that was the... Uh, I, yeah, I did. That was mom's name that she would call me when I was uh, not necessarily uh, straightening up and flying right. When, when he wasn't her favorite son. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's exactly right. How's your knee doing? My knee is fine. My toe, not so much. Oh, toe. Like out soccer too much. She slid in the home coming down the bank this morning. All right. Good morning. Good morning. For those of you who may not know who I am, uh, my name is Charlie Hall. I sometimes go by Charles or Charles Roy or Chuckles or Uncle Charles. I, ha I have many aliases. And, and I go to all of them. I respond to all of them. So um, it's my pleasure on behalf of the family to welcome you here to this great day in which we're going to celebrate the life of Christine, Mom. And I appreciate your diligence in being here and because of the uncertainty of the weather and so forth. But what a great little breeze we have blowing through. And instead of being 90 degrees, like it has been yeah. for the last few weeks, we got a little bit of reprieve from the heat. So thank you for being here. First, a few logistics. Number one, there is a super special bathroom just right up the hill right there. And so it's air conditioned. And if you have need of a facility, um, that's the place to go. In fact, we were joking yesterday that we stopped using the restrooms in the house and we started using that one. Yeah. It's so nice. So, so it's it's really nice, and but we do recommend number two uh, that you go up the path between the hunt ranches because we've already figured out that's the safest path to go up the hill and everything. So we recommend that you go up and down that particular area and not skip this steep part over here. And plus there's an extension cord and so forth. Only other logistic, number three, you can see that there's photos that are on the tables. A lot of candidates that our family photographer, my wife Michelle, has, and others have taken through the years. And if you want to take some of those as, as mementos, feel free to do so. There are other mementos that you received uh, when, you, when you checked in and we got your name tag and so forth. And... There's a lot of sharing of memories that, of course, you're going to take with you as well. All right, so some could not make it here today because of various conflicts. But over the last six weeks, and it's been six weeks since Mom passed, they have been uh, sending cards, uh, text messages, emails, expressing not only their condolences but several different stories about the relationship they had with Mom. And we'll be sharing some of those stories throughout the day. Some of you have traveled great distances, all the way from the state of Florida, all the way from the state of Utah, all the way from uh, the state of Texas and Tennessee, South Carolina. Others of you have been local, but it doesn't matter the distance you traveled. We still appreciate the fact that you're here and to share this particular moment with us in celebration of mom. Now we have a diverse crowd and as you will see in, in most occasions like this, there are different ages. They are very young to <laughs> more mature and wise, right? We have different 
nationalities, we have different ethnicities, we have different religions even, we have some city folk, we have some country folk, we have some family, some non-family, and yes, given the odds, we probably have a complete spectrum of, of liberal to conservative on the political standpoint as well. That's just the way our nation is right now. But there is one single unifying thread that brings us all here today. And that's the impact that Christine had on our lives. Yeah. And how she touched each and every life. Either directly, because you have a family relationship or a friendship or what have you, or a member of the church. Some of you have knew Christine as mom. Some of you as sister, some as sister-in-law, some as aunt, some as aunt-in-law, some as mamma, sister in Christ, um, and friend. Regardless of those relationships, mom impacted every single one of us. And so we're here today to celebrate that. It is a happy day. And though our hearts are still aching, and we're each one of us that are on our grieving journey. For this moment, we will celebrate the impact that she had on our lives. Now, there's some here today that didn't know her that well, or maybe didn't even know her at all. But instead, you were here to support someone who's very close to you, a friend, maybe a relative, that you want to be here to support them. And we also appreciate the fact that you're here. You're very dear to us, and we appreciate the fact that you are you love us enough to be here in this time of both grieving and celebration. So regardless of the why as to why you're here, thank you. Thank you for being here because our presence, each and one of our presence here today is a collective expression of what Christine meant to us. And so we're, as I said, we're going to celebrate that. Now, at one point in time, Michelle and I had a preacher uh, that preached a, a rather unusual sermon because he's, he preached a sermon about signatures. And I don't know if you remember this, Michelle. Jim Ross preached a sermon about signatures. And he said that each one of us as we travel our journey through life, we leave a signature on the people that we interact with. And he related it to the Declaration of Independence. And if you remember that document that our founding fathers developed, there's a bunch of signatures down at the bottom. And because there's a bunch of signatures, everybody wrote their signature pretty small, except for one. And that's John Hancock. <laughs> Now, we don't know, I mean, we don't typically, unless you were really a history buff, we don't typically know a lot about John Hancock, except he wrote his signature in this big, ginormous font, right? Big letters. And he says, so it is with people, is that as we go through life, there are some who leave little itty-bitty signatures on our life. They come in and out very quickly. But then there are those such as mom, who though short and, and vertical stature, <laughs> left a great big humongoid signature on our lives. May it be for each one of us that the people that we come in contact with, may it be that we leave a big signature, as big a signature as mom has left on our lives, may we leave a signature on other people's lives. Now we're here today, um, obviously, to celebrate. Many of us share a common faith. So I'm going to open this up in a word of prayer. So if you would, please join me as we kick off things in the right way. So let us pray. Our most kind, loving, gracious Heavenly Father, we are in awe of your power, and your majesty and the depths of your never-ending love and mercy. 
that you should even know our name is a wonder. And we are humbled that you would choose to lavish upon us your continued presence and your guidance day in and day out. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and blessing us in ways that we can only partially understand at this moment. So we're comforted today, Lord, by the fact that there is simply nothing outside of your purview, nothing outside of your control, nothing that catches you by surprise. You knew full well the timing of mom's passing, and there's no single detail of that day that is outside or was outside of your divine will. We praise you for that. And though our hearts ache, and though we may miss our mom, our friend, our aunt, our mamma, we find <coughs> immense joy in the fact that you were there each and every moment of her passing, and she sits with you in glory today. So as we gather here to celebrate and the impact that she had on our lives and that gigantic signature that she left upon us, may the words of our mouths and meditations of our hearts be pleasing unto you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. 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 All right, so there was... Um, there's some music that I've interlaced within the ceremony today, and I thought one of the, the pieces of music that would set the tone for not only is, is mom in God's presence, but because the uh, omniscience of God, he is here with us. He is everywhere all at once. And so to celebrate that particular fact, I have a song that I think I first heard when, when we were members at Woodland Baptist back when I was a little kid and there was a quartet that came that afternoon after Sunday worship and mom really appreciated gospel quartets. So this is a song called Sweet, Sweet Spirit and this particular song is one that I heard mom sing time and time again all through the years. Now, Mom would tell you that she couldn't sing, but that didn't let her stop, her singing. She sang loud and proud, and I thought she had a, a voice of an angel, right? But let's, let's hear the words of this quartet. Brian Free and Assurance is the quartet, by the way. There's a sweet, sweet spirit. Down. 
amen and amen. That was some powerful harmony, and Mom loved that. So let me give you just a little preview of the rest of the service. In just a moment, I'm going to ask my Uncle Kenneth to come and offer some remarks, and then I'll follow him with some, more, some remarks. And then Trish, my sister, is going to come and uh, read a poem that she wrote. And then, fair warning, it's open mic time. <laughs> And all the introverts immediately started looking down when I said that. This is your chance to say what you would like. There's no pressure. It's just that if you have a few comments to make, that would be the time to do so. And then we'll have um, a little bit of, of a tree dedication ceremony. And then we'll follow that with some closing remarks and then there are some refreshments and, and light lunch over here. And we will continue sharing the stories, the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. We, was, we will continue sharing the rest of the story about mom and the exploits and each of our experiences. So that's the, the game plan. So now I'd invite my uncle, Kenneth Reinhardt, Reverend Kenneth Reinhardt, sometimes known as Sonny. Yeah and uh, to offer some remarks. Kenneth was Christine's brother-in-law for, did you say 54 years? A little longer than that. A little longer? How? A little longer than that. Yeah, 50, how long? 56. 56 years, right? And as such, he knows the good. The really good. The really good. The not so good and perhaps a few skeletons in the closet, as all families do. So, Kenneth, bring us a, some, some comments of hope in the midst of what we're yes, feeling. Sir. Amen. God bless your heart. Amen. Let me say, first of all, thank you so very much. Uh, Christine was more than my sister-in-law, of course. After all these years, uh, Margaret and I met at Tuscola the first year, and, and I chased her. She caught, chased her till she caught me. <laughs> but anyway, and uh, then I got to meet the family, and that's always interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You meet a girl or you meet a guy, and then you got to go meet the family. Well, it wasn't a real chore to meet the family. <laughs> I fell in love with them, and God has blessed us in many ways. I tell you one or two real quick things. We got married. And we rented a little apartment. I came through Waynesville a while back and and looked, and that old apartment's still standing. They tore, torn everyone around it down. So Margaret and I had rented a little apartment. You had to get on your knees, take a shower, bed folded, that back and forth. And we was living the high life. Uh, of course, when you get, first get married, you don't care. But anyway, and I pulled in there and I asked that guy. I said, "Do you care if I go in there for a moment?" No, it's fine. Well, anyway, went in, looked around, took pictures with my phone. and But that's not what I want to mention. It. Then, a little later, we thought, we'd like to have a real house to live in. So, Charles, David, and Charles' family, her, their dad, his mother had passed away. and So, we rented their house in Jones Cove. And uh, so, there was a barn on the house at the house so you know I said to myself I said well uh, I'll see how much of this I can fool with and really all I was responsible for was the yard but if you got a barn you want a farm right <laughs> so I decided that I wanted to do a little farming and I went and bought me a little pig and before I bought that pig I built a of course a hog pen I built it out as anybody know what a skid is a pallet. That's what I built it out of. So I got my mother-in-law to come over and look at it, and she said, well, I don't know what you're going to do when it grows up. And she said, besides that, said, uh, how are you going to feed it? I thought, I don't know. So anyway, I managed to raise the pig. It, of course, became a hog, so we decided to have a hog killing. And uh, Christine was our neighbor, of course, with Charles and 
uh, Patricia, and you come later. <laughs> of course, David. And anyway, we uh, were there and going to do the hogs. So Martyr's granddaddy, Johnson, came over. He said, I'm going to show you people one more time how to kill a hog. Well, there's myself, Margaret, Christine, Grandpa Johnson, and uh, Margaret's mama. And so I think they told me, said, go shoot the pig or the hog. I really didn't want to shoot it, so I don't remember if it's Christine or Mamie. One went and killed the pig or the hog. So anyway, so one of the first things we did when we moved to Jones Cove was have a hog killing. I'd done that all my life, but all of a sudden now I don't have my daddy to help me with it. So that leads up to this. Christine was a multifaceted woman. <laughs> she was a mountain woman. You don't know what that means. Uh, I'd heard many years ago, if you're going to be a mountain woman, you've got to be tough. Christine was tough. She knew a lot of things, and she was always willing and glad to help. But needless to say, we had a time after we got the, pit, the hog killed, I had to tire the hog pen apart to get it out. And if you've never been to a hog killing, you need to go to find out where your pork chops come from. But anyway, we got that thing hung and gutted. And I looked, and Christine and her mother took over. You know why they took over? They had to. They had to. I didn't know. I mean, I couldn't remember what we did. But anyway, I, I thought that was one of the most wonderful days. You remember that, Margaret? And I know Charles Roy might oh, I remember. remember that, but uh, I remember. anyway. And why I say she's a mountain woman, because you see, mountain women, and they've been talked about all through history. And a lot of times in a lot of places, when they think of mountain folks, uh, I know I've done revivals in places, and the per preacher would tell them where I was from, and they asked me if we really wore shoes up here. <laughs> I said, only when we can afford them. And, but uh, a lot of ideas about mountain people. But Christine was a mountain woman. She knew how to step forward. And uh, she, we depend on her so much, the years that we spent as neighbors. In fact, I was in the guard and come back from Fort Jackson. And we didn't have a vehicle. So Christine had to take me to, to my drill period to know. So you see, when... Uh, she got me and Margaret. Uh, she'd already had Margaret, but now she had to take care of me too. <laughs> but she was one of the sweetest people it's ever been. And <clears throat> what I loved about her, she knew a lot of things, but she didn't want you to think she knew a lot of things. But she was very knowledgeable. And of course, looking at these plants, you know about the nursery. And so we decided we wanted shrubbery on her, how our home place where we built. And they said, her and Charles said, well, I tell you what, if y'all will help us in the nursery, we were moving it from Jones Cove to here. You can have all the shrubbery you want. They didn't tell us we was going to kill, they were going to kill us. <laughs> but they, this woman was a woman of work. And she didn't allow laying around her house. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, if you asked her for help, you could count on her. Like I said, as time goes, you are their brother-in-law, but you just become family and friend. And a few things I'd like to mention to her but about her, but Psalm 116, verse 15, simply says this, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. The word precious means dear. We often talk about something being precious. That means it meant a lot. Yes, it does. But it, sometimes we think it means that it costed a lot. We think that a lot of times. But when you use the word precious, to me it means dear. And so that's what we've experienced with Christine. There was a few things that she was. Uh, like I said, she was a mountain woman. But she was a, a good mother. And I know she helped Margaret so much when Kenny was born. And through these years, we've grown closer with every passing year. I remember we, uh, through the years, we've come to here to pick black or blueberries. And uh, 
I remember, can I use the word nasty, Brown? His mom was back here. Eric, uh, I knew Eric and his brothers and all, but anyway, and her, his, their mother was here with Christine a lot and just had a great time. And so I would pick three blueberries, eat two, put one in the bucket. That's what you're supposed to do when you're a child, I guess. But anyway, and we'd get through it, and Christine would have a gallon, and then we'd pick maybe Mark and I together. Might get a gallon, uh, but we always look forward to coming down and picking blackberries, or blueberries, I keep saying blackberries. Uh, if you want blackberries, then she's got plenty. Uh, but anyway, we thank God for all of that. But a few things that I'd like to mention. First of all, who she was. It was a young girl that was born in 1948. I have, we have a picture at the house, and I'm sure Christine had the picture. And it's uh, her, their father, Gaston Johnson, Jr. Their mother, Mamie Johnson, standing a, in front of an old 1950 model Ford. And there is Christine, she's the oldest. There's Margaret, she's the middle. And Shirley was the youngest one. And so I own a 50 model Ford, and I know that uh, their daddy had a good taste in cars. But anyway, she, uh, uh, those pictures have meant a lot to us down through the years. And a lot of stories you can tell about Christine, but I just want to mention a few things today, who she was. She was a very kind and caring person. But if you didn't want to know what she thought, don't ask her. Because if you asked her, you would get what she thought. She didn't sugarcoat much of anything, did she? No. And uh, that's one thing that was so precious about her. Uh, she gave you her ideas and her opinion. And so what an honor we've had, that I've had to be in this family, and I thank God for it. So we've raised our kids, watched Charles and Patricia and David grow up. And I remember years ago, I had just gotten saved. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've had sinus, of course. I had just gotten saved, and we were having a dinner over our mother-in-law's house that day. And so she looked at me and she said, Sonny, would you uh, ask the blessing on the, about, on the food? I said, I'd be glad to. See, I'd only been in church three months, somewhere around there. So I was praying, and when I opened my eyes, David was standing in front of me, looking up at me. Try that again. <laughs> and uh, David looked at me and he said, I didn't know you could pray. <laughs> I said, son, I couldn't until I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's my topic today. Who she was was somebody that one moment in her life, she had come to the realization that she needed someone beyond herself. That she came to a place that she needed someone that was going to take care of her, be with her all the days of her life, and then would have her a place when she went into eternity. She came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as her own personal Savior. And if you didn't want to know that, you better not ask her. But if you didn't ask her, she would tell you something about the greatest person that she had ever known in her life, our blessed Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. This woman volunteered for everything that uh, they did out here at the church, or here, right out the road there. Everything that went on, Chris was doing it, quilting, and everybody at that church loved her, but she loved everyone at that church. Now, when they were going to church up at, uh, I don't know what the name of it was, uh, on Cedar Top. What? Woodland. Woodland, yeah, my mind. But anyway, uh, I was staying home. And so I thought, well, Margaret was taking Kenny. Christine was taking those. And uh, then she said to me one day, she said, you know what you need? I said, what do I need? She said, you need to get in church. So why don't you just get right with the Lord and do something for him? Because it was always Margaret was taking care of it. I didn't have to worry about it too much. But you see, I've got a special relationship to her because she's one of those people that told me about Jesus. 
She didn't tell me in a way that I thought she was preaching to me, but she let me know that what I needed, if I was going to have peace in my life, if I was going to have any joy in my life, if I was going to have any hope beyond this life, then I must know the only one that can give those things. And so one night on graveyard shift on number 13 paper machine, I bowed before the Lord December the 2nd, 1973. Laid a stencil brush down. I was stenciling rows to go to shipping and places. And I said, Lord, I don't know how to ask you. I don't know what I'm supposed to say. But I said, Lord, you've got to help me. God gloriously reached down and saved my soul at that very moment. And I look back through the years and when we got together, we didn't talk much politics either. And I'll tell you what, if you was around Chris Long, you were going to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's been such a joy, not only to have her as my sister-in-law, but as my sister in Christ. And so what an honor it's been. Who was she? She was a child of the king. That's why God could write Psalm 116, verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. What would make death so precious to God? Well, because of the price that was paid to give redemption to mankind. I mean, when you think about how you get saved and what it took to get us born again, then thank God you can see why God calls it precious. Something else that makes it precious is that Christine, when she was out there at that chicken coop, we got the call like all the family did. Mary, all through these years, is stuck by Christine. This young lady, I met her back many years ago. She came to work with us in the labor crew, running jackhammers, crawling through sewers, just whatever they had for us to do. And uh, she's one of those type of people that when you met Mary, she didn't let you do her job. She would work, and she's been mighty great. But she loved Christine as if Chris was her own sister. But when you walked up that day, none of us will ever forget. When the call came, because it was such a shock, we were getting ready to have a new grandchild down in South Carolina, in Greenville. And so Christine was, when Lynn was going to the hospital, we were supposed to call Christine, swing by, pick her up, pick all the stuff she had made for the baby, and go down for the birth. Needless to say, Christine went home before we could ever have that to happen. But what I love about it all is this, is the experience that she had when it came her time to go home. I've been in too many hospitals, death rooms, nursing homes, places where people are living their last few minutes. My parents, others, my in-laws. I've heard too many people say, can you see that? And you're standing there, you don't see a thing. All you know is your loved one is dying. Your heart's broken and you're wanting them to stay. And they're talking about what they see. And they see angels coming to receive their soul and spirit, to carry them back to heaven. And so the death, when the death of God's saints come, it's precious to God because he sends TWA to take them home, two-winged angel. And when they get home, here is her experience. First of all, she's looking for someone special. Someone she's talked about since she came to know him. Someone right over here at this church they've sung about, the pastors have preached about. They sewed the quilts in the name of. They did the feeding and all the things that they volunteered to do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so who do you think she wanted to see when she got home? She'll want to see the one that loved her so much that he was willing to be born, creator of this world, universe, but to limit himself to a body and be born of a virgin and live a perfect sinless life, but then go to an old rugged cross, have himself nailed there to shed his blood 
so that Christine Johnson Hall could come home one day. And so the first sight she saw after the angels was the Lord. I remember it hadn't been long until Charles, we called him Charles Roy, we called him Roy. <laughs> Many names we called him. But it hadn't been long since he had left and gone home. I remember they were over at our house a few years ago before it got worse. And we were sitting there talking. He he stayed out in the uh, driveway, and I went out. We sat around and talked. He said, as soon as we get a chance, he said, me and you and Margaret and Chris, we need to go on a trip out west. I said, you name the time, and we'll go. We never got to go out west. But he found something much better because he told me that day, he said, you know, I don't know when I'm going to die. None of us do. But he said, I want you to know that I'm ready to meet the Lord. The soul was saved. So Christine, she went on, had to go on with her life. Out here working these grounds, she loved this place more than anybody could, I guess, because it meant it was her homestead. It was her home. Her and Charles had come together bought all this and built all this but when she got home she got to see the next person that's the Lord Jesus Christ first her husband Charlie Hall the next person she's got to see her you talk about a reunion can you imagine the tears that she said, shed the nights that she felt so lonely the times that she spent there in that bedroom cried maybe herself to sleep then all of a sudden, God has done one of the most marvelous things. He's brought her home, and she gets to see him first of all the family. And I don't know if they quit hugging yet, just to be honest. You say, how would she know him? God says, we'll be known as we were. No. When someone passes away, you don't become an angel. You're still you. Charles Roy Hall, Jr., when the Lord takes him home, you get to heaven and see him, he'll still, you'll recognize him because he'll still look like Charles Roy. Isn't that a glorious thought? And so for these, I call them kids because I guess they are compared to myself. But they've got some memories that no one can take away. They had a mama that loved them and a daddy that worked, I know he worked hard, he done a lot of work. Mary worked with him on shift repair. I had to work with him some. <coughs> And then we got to be neighbors. So I know what this family's been through. But I know now, thank God, the next crowd she probably got to see was mom. There's no word in the alphabet like the word mom. And when her and Mamie met that day, never to part again. So there's been a reunion. But you know, we all, and I'm going to close with this. I laid this out. Because if you're a preacher, when you lay that, people say, oh, Lord, I've already took up too much time. There's a few things, you know, everybody, somebody said, what did he leave behind when he died? He left everything. So I came up with what I want to leave behind. First, I want to leave behind a stack of wore out Bibles. I do. I want to leave a stack of Bibles. Somebody said, that, that fella must have done a lot of reading. Well, I was feeding my soul. So I want to say to Chris's children, grandchildren, daughters-in-law, son and the whole family, I just want to say to you, the greatest thing that you can do in memory of your mama is to live your life for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I'll guarantee you one thing, age and death will sneak up on us just when we think we've finally arrived, and then it'll come. But oh, when it comes, what makes the difference is that blood has already been applied, the blood of Christ. So the price that God paid for our soul, that makes it precious to him. He's never lost one from the deathbed to home. Everyone that has died in the Lord has arrived safely over home. So thank you.
family for letting me be here today. I just hope I've helped somebody. We thank God for you, and it's been an honor. Greater than I can use words to tell you what this lady meant to us. All that she did for us when we were first struggling, starting out. We fussed a lot. She'd come down there and tell us, you better shut up now. Remember that? She was our mom <coughs> figure. So you see, there's so much you can tell about Christine, and I don't have time. But I thank God for every memory that we have. And so just before I step down, I'd like to have a word of prayer right quickly. Our Father, is, Brother Charles, has already prayed. We do thank you, Lord, for this day. Father, we thank you for what it means to our own hearts and lives. Lord, we thank you for this precious soul. Lord God, that you placed in our life many years ago. And Lord, for 50-some years, Lord, we got to know her. Not just as neighbor, not just as a friend, but sister. And we praise you for it. I pray, Lord, today that you would bless this service. Bless these young folks, Lord. Bless this family. And Lord, as they go on with their lives, wherever they go, anywhere in this world, help them to carry along the heritage Lord, that they've received from these old mountains of western North Carolina. And Lord, we'll praise you and give you the glory for all that you do. In Christ's wonderful name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Anything I can ever do to be a help to the family, please holler. Thank you very much. people say holler, they don't say holler. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kenneth. Um, I knew the odds were very high that he would be talking about where mom is, right, in heaven. And it was, I was thinking about music for this particular ceremony. <laughs> there was one song that was very special to mom. And I heard her sing along with this particular song several times. It's by a group called Mercy Me. It says, I can only imagine. And it talks about heaven. I just want to play a little bit of that because that'll that'll set a stage of, of or a, a picture of where mom is <coughs> at this moment. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me I can only imagine Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine I can only imagine When that day comes And I find myself Standing in the sun I can only imagine When all I will do Is forever Forever worship you only imagine, yeah. I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Yeah, I can only imagine. 
imagine. I want to stop right there, and I want to make the point. Mom no longer has to imagine. That's right. <laughs> She's just there <laughs> in the midst of glory. So I want to offer some of my own comments uh, for the next few minutes in eulogy for my mom. Now, I will be the first one to admit I'm biased. There's no doubt about it. And, and, but it, the events that I'm about to recollect are, are as true and accurate as I can remember. But again... I'm not, I don't, I have this unique ability to forget all the bad things I ever did right. and only recollect, recollect the good. So, and I'm just going to pass over all the things that don't put me in a good light. But I know one thing, mom would have loved events like this. Now, she would, she would have been looking forward to seeing everyone and breaking bread together. But on the flip side, it would have stressed her out to no end. <laughs> I mean, she would have been, uh, you know, heading up an army of folks and do this, do that. I mean, that she would have been stressed, but she would have loved it, but it would have stressed her out. But of course, she's not here with us. But if she were, I mean, she would have been greeting everybody. Uh, Jeff, she would have been talking about your sermon three weeks ago, saying you know, that God's got this, and. She would have been saying, good job, Brother Brotherton. You know how long I've been waiting to say that? Brother Brotherton. <laughs> yeah. And, of course, uh, Tiny and Eugene can't make it today because Tiny fell, of course, and Eugene came by earlier and said they couldn't make it. But she would have been just hugging and celebrating their 70th wedding anniversary. I mean, she would have been all over that. And... She would have been the first to go up to uh, Jason and Lynn and talk about little Jay Lynn right, and how, how, the, how the quilt was working out. Right, she would have been all over that. And, of course, um, Macy, she would have been so excited to meet you and everything because that's all she talked about was coming out in September y'all's wedding and everything so she would have been excited to meet you and Hudson and wishing you luck with John <laughs> but that's what mom would have done right because that's what mom did of course she's not with us and you know to this day I miss my daily phone calls with her and I know that that Shirley and, and Sherry and John couldn't make it today either. And they talk with her every night. And because Shirley re recounts uh, what mom would say every time, getting on the phone. Well, how was your day, Shirley Jean? <laughs> so that was, that, was, that was just those interactions, right? Now, on those phone calls I had with mom, we didn't talk about a lot of things of substance every day. There's just not a lot of earth-shattering things that happen. So we we talk about, um, you know, after the weather and everything, and just the, what was going on in the family. But there were certain times that there was stuff that was critically important. And there was somebody in need. And particularly there would be somebody in need of prayer. And there were many occasions Mom and I would sit there and we would pray right there on the phone that person or that situation <laughs> those are special moments yes, sir. those are special moments and in fact it was one of those calls to mom when Michelle and I were on vacation in Lewis Delaware and we were going back to the airport to fly home and I was talking to mom and she was out at the chicken coop of course collecting eggs, and I was asking her about the Mother's Day flowers and the flowers that that you see in front of you and the basket that was in the very back was very similar to the, the flowers that I sent. I always send them early because I work with the floral industry and a part of my job, and I know that florists get covered up, so I sent them early. 
So this was Friday, May 10th. I, they had gotten there the day before. We were talking about the flowers, and she was talking about how pretty this particular flowers uh, in the arrangement were and everything. And I'd sent her some chocolate. And of course, I asked her, well, what flavor is your favorite? And she said, all of them. So I said, are you going to share? Or are you going to keep them all to yourself? I never got an answer to that. That's when she passed, right there. So she was in earthly paradise beside the chicken coop where she loved to be, right? One second, talking to us, and in paradise the next second. He said, wow, you were talking to your mom when she, but yeah, what a blessing for us to have been laughing to hear the joy in her in her voice and talking about chocolate. <laughs> what better thing could there be? Right? And then she passes. So that was a great blessing for me to know that, um, unlike my dad, who underwent several years of decline before he finally passed, mom wanted to go quick. And God granted her wish, and she went quick. But that was a blessing for us to hear her voice and to know that she was just fine going into glory. All right, so uh, I know this is redundant to what, Sonny, you talked about, but Mom loved Jesus. She, and never was this more illustrated to me than when she was in the hospital dealing with stage 4 lymphoma. And back in, in 2015, Trish saved her life by coming up here and forcing mom to come down and visit her doctor, Dr. Chowdhury, and forcing mom to go down there for treatment and everything. Because you, those of you who know mom, she didn't want to be a bother to anybody. And she endured a lot of pain and a lot of um, ailments from that sickness. And it was hard to drag it out of her in terms of how she was really doing. So she, it nearly cost her her life. So, my, Trish, you saved her life and gave us seven more years with Mom by doing that. But I had made it into Greenville, and Mom was at the hospital. It was December 15th on 2015, and I was staying overnight in the hospital. I got into one of the little chairs there, and at 3.40 a.m., she said out of the blue, it don't matter as long as you have a place. So I sat there and I started thinking, oh, well. she said then, right, right afterward, I can hear you. And I thought first, then I asked her, well, who can you hear? She said, the Lord. Mm -hmm. And of course I said, well, what's he saying? <laughs> he said, I'll have a place for you when it's time. And then a few seconds after that, He's so good to me. He's so good to me. Man, she, it, my mind was blown. Right? And she had that presence of Almighty God right there with her in that moment, comforting her. I'll have a place for you when it's time. And then a, a few seconds goes by. She's, she's back asleep and everything. And all of a sudden, her eyes go wide open. And I asked her, what do you see? She says, I see the light. Mm -hmm. Now, my mom had sat um, with my Uncle Eddie before he passed. And he had said, I see the light. And mom had told him, well, go towards the light. So that's going in right in my mind in that instant. And I said, now, remember what you told Eddie. Go towards the light. And no, she starts squinting and said, no, I'm talking about the light and the ceiling. It's in my eyes. <laughs> oh, my word. <laughs> now, there were plenty of other ways in which my mom demonstrated her love for Jesus. And caregiving was one of those ways. And her whole life was spent taking care of somebody or something. And she started her family, of course, at a very young age 
when she was 5,133 days old. And I'll let you do the math. But that was pretty early. Fortunately, I was an incredibly easy baby to take care of. I've heard that. Now, I made, I made up for it my teenage years, but, but at least I gave her a little bit of break. I can't say the same for my siblings, though. <laughs> no, it's just this. Another example, of course, taking care of my dad. Uh, his his lengthy, lengthy decline, and from the many strokes and, and diabetes and dementia, it, it was not an easy time. And you heard me talk about that at Dad's memorial service. But she took on even that challenge of caretaking with a you know a servant's heart, without complaint. Well, mostly. <laughs> but it was it was again evidence of her unconditional love. Now she spent a lot of time taking care of her animals through the years, particularly Tigger, and that's the little dog that you see here in the picture up front. And that dog, she loved that dog as though it was human, because while she was struggling with cancer, that dog was her shadow. It that dog never left her side and brought comfort. And so she spent a lot of time at Tigger's end of life taking care and, and, pro and prolonging his life of course another thing I have great respect for my mom is that she had a heart for service and Sonny you alluded to that she was a, she had a servant's heart you talked about her volunteering efforts and she even volunteered as president of the community center I mean she got way out of her comfort zone on that because mom liked to be in the background and she peeled, I don't know how many thousands of bushels of apple, making apple pies and applesauce, and just literally volunteered with anybody that needed anything, she was there. So that was, that was awesome. Mom, how do I do this one? It was curious though. In spite of the fact that she loved serving others, she hated to be a bother for somebody else and let somebody serve her. And again, you saved her life by forcing her to come down. Now, one of the other things that's really cool about my mom is that uh, with her right brain dominance, she had a lot of skills in a lot of different areas. She had numerous arts and crafts that she participated in. You alluded to the quilting and the countless prayer quilts that she and the quilting group from church developed. I mean, you don't develop a quilt. Quilted the quilt and gave those prayer quilts to other people just as a sign that somebody cared, that somebody was praying for them. Mom also had a generous heart. She'd give you, you know, the proverbial, just she'd give you the shirt off her back. But she didn't do that, stop with that. She, all the vegetables, the strawberries, how many, you know, pints of strawberries and pints of blueberries and gallons of blueberries and vegetables and, uh, I mean, squash, okra, green beans. I mean, innumerable bushels of green beans. I spent, and I counted it up in preparation for this, 125,600 minutes stringing green beans in my life. <laughs> Just it. Green beans, stringing green beans. To this day, I don't eat green beans. <laughs> but we gave so many green beans away, corn, squash, because that's the way it used to be. We didn't, we didn't, that was the, the, the quote unquote welfare, welfare system in the country is that we grew in churches and we shared and that neighbors shared with neighbors and that's the way we did it. And there were, there were um, folks who might have gone hungry otherwise that didn't go hungry because of that. So my mom was flat out good at growing stuff. <laughs> I mean, she had a green thumb, and that's what made her so great when we owned the nursery business. And she was literally a living, breathing farmer's almanac. So she had a lot of skills. She's good at construction, too. At our old place, we have an entire rock wall in the living room, a fireplace, and this, the, uh, that we'd gotten rock off the mountain and 
built this entire wall. And of course, it was curious that long about halfway through that project, she dropped the rock on her foot and she couldn't make cement after that. That had to be my job after that. And she would hobble around, but then if she needed something, she could walk pretty good. I don't know why that was. Yeah, I got good at mixing cement. Anyway, as, as Sonia alluded to, mom was a, a perpetual motion machine. Early on in her life, she was a, a neat freak, and she loved a clean house. And if you drop something, you picked it up. Remember the rules, kids, that we talked about yesterday? If you drop something, you picked it up. If you spilled something, you made sure that you told somebody, not just leave it there. No jumping on the couches. Uh, there, were, there were mammals' rules, so to speak. But she spent a lot of time early... Um, if you remember the story of Martha and Mary in Scripture, where the disciples are there and Martha, the two, one of the two sisters, is busy preparing food, making sure everybody's got refreshments, and Mary is glued to Jesus' feet, hung, hanging on his every word. Well, I saw my mom transition from being the Martha character to being the Mary character. And there was a time when she said, you know what? A little bit, a little bit of dust isn't going to kill anybody. <laughs> Particularly if it meant she had more time for serving others, more time for getting on Tigger, more time for quilting, etc. And lastly, as Sonny alluded to, and if I hadn't said it before, which I already have, Mom loved Jesus. And she demonstrated it in very powerful ways. And she made sure that we knew about Jesus. She made sure that we knew where hope really lied. And when I was six years old, this is one of those other volunteering. Mom was volunteering, co-leading vacation Bible school. And that last night of vacation Bible school, you always have an altar call, last night of vacation Bible school. And I responded to the wooing of the Holy Spirit, and I, too, dedicated my life to Christ and, and said, this is the day. Right? I didn't know what that meant. I was six, but I knew there was something more powerful, and I'd seen it lived out in Mom. So I took Jesus as my Lord and Savior that day. I'm sorry to say I knew him as Savior for a lot more years than I knew him as Lord. It took me a while to, to get to that point where he was truly the Lord of my life. There, there's a little subtle difference there. I knew that difference because Mom lived out Jesus being Lord and Savior of her life. And one of my, I don't know if it's a favorite memory, but it's a powerful memory. That even in those few, very few instances in which I needed correction, those few times that I needed correction, and I got correction, she would come in later that night, and she, was, she thought I was sleeping. But when those occasions, she would come in, and she would put her hand on my head, and I could hear her mouthing, prayer and tears to the sobbing and I know she did that to all of us when we had correction she would come in and lay her hand on our head and pray what a powerful a sign illustration of unconditional love that was my mom that's what I celebrate today right that unconditional love so, Mom, I love you dearly, and I look forward to our reunion. So now I'm, I'm going to turn the, the microphone over to Trish. As I mentioned earlier, um, she has great skills. But my sister's much smarter than I am. Yeah, I have a PhD, but my sister's much smarter. She's both left-brained and right-brained because she has not only intellect on the left side of her brain, but she has the same art and craft skills that my mom had on the right side of her brain. 
and she's written some music, she's written poems, and she wrote a poem for mom several years back, and she updated that poem recently because she says, I'm better at it now. <laughs> so, Trish, come on up and, and read your poem. Thanks, Charles. <clears throat> Not sure I'll be able to do it, but I will try. So I have lots of friends here, and some just came in a little late. Chris, um, I want you to know I fell <laughs> this morning, and you weren't there. Yeah, yeah. I have a habit of, you know, if I don't fall at an event, it's not an event. All right. So, and Chris typically catches me, and you weren't there this morning, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, I think mom, my mother, also had a tendency to fall, so it runs in the family. So I wrote the first poem in, it was 28 years ago, yep, 1996, I think is when I wrote it, and it, like you said, I read it, I was like, oh my gosh, she loved it, she had it framed, she loved it, but I, I could do better, so here it goes, it's called Her Legacy, in loving memory we gather here today, to honor a life that touched us in every way. A mother, a guide, a light so true, her spirit lives on in all that we do. She taught us kindness, gentle and sweet, a warmth that made a touched heart complete. With open arms and a loving embrace, she showed the world her beauty and grace. Her strength was quiet. <laughs> Her strength was quiet, yet fiercely strong, a pillar of courage leading us along through trials and storms. <laughs> she always stood tall. As they said, her wisdom and faith <laughs> guiding us all. You might have to come read this. <laughs> come help me. <clears throat> come help me. <clears throat> All right. So you do this one. Okay. I gotta get a love to mine. Okay. <laughs> Her laughter was a melody bright and clear, a joyous sound brought us cheer. With humor and love in so many ways, her light-hearted spirit filled our days. Understanding flowed from her tender heart, a gift she gave from the very start. She listened with patience, always wielding, a beacon of comfort, steadfast and unyielding. Love was her language, spoken and true in every action, in all that she do. She gave it freely, without expectation, a love that knew no limitation. Integrity, honor, compassion, and grace, these are the qualities we saw in her face. She shaped my being, she lit my way. Her legacy in me will forever stay. You finished. <laughs> so as remember as we remember her life today let us carry her virtues in all that we say mm -hmm. for in our hearts her spirit burns bright her love and lessons in eternal light amen that's good sister <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't read the whole thing, but she was special. Yeah, awesome. Now, I don't know if you know this, but every single service, it must be my electrifying personality. 
I think we're good. I'll just back up from it a little bit. Yeah, thanks, Angie. Now, I don't know if you know this, but when people are surveyed about the number one thing that they fear the most, it's not spiders, it's not snakes, <laughs> crocodiles, whatever, or chickens that peck you get trying to get their eggs. That's not it. The number one thing that people fear is public speaking. So you know what's coming. I warned you ahead of time. If there are those who would like to say something regarding mom, their friend, their family member, what have you, I would invite you to come and say a few words if you would like. Brother Brotherton, you had... All right, very good. <laughs> Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's good to see everybody here today. I just want to extend from uh, Reverend Farron Duncan, who's with us today, and uh, uh, Christine's church family, our condolences. Uh, we certainly grieve with you today, but we also celebrate. Yeah. I came down on May the 10th. That was my grandson's birthday, Liam, uh, when Christine fell and, and passed. Uh, I got a call that something very bad had happened. And so I just live up the road, brought my golf cart down here and saw Mary and, and we saw Christine. It was a tragic day for sure. But we celebrate today. You talk about a signature, and she had one. You know, if you've ever walked through a cemetery, all the headstones have a birthday and they have a date of birth, a date of death. Two very important dates. But there's something else there. It's a dash. And it's how we live that dash that really matters. Man, what's in the middle? Christine, she lived her dash. My grandson loved to come down here and sit with her in the swing, talk about the chickens, the white-faced horse, and just all the beauty and creation that was going on around here. And Christine would share with him because she wasn't indeed a servant. You talk about that Bible. Reverend, that's worn out. I'll tell you, show me one that's falling apart. I'll show you a life put together. When that cover's worn out and the spine is broken on that book, you know that uh, she spent a lot of time in the Word. And she was a servant. And I think about Jesus and the servant that he was. And I think about him on the Passover feast with his disciples. When he got up, took off his outer gar garment, and what did he do? He got down on his knees because he was a servant. He started washing feet. Christine was that kind of servant. Whatever needed to be done, she was there doing it. And I really thank her for all that she did. Those quilts, I can't tell you how many have laid across our altar, how many she has sewn with the team that's uh, part of them here today. All the stitches that go into that is just so time consuming. But man, the lives that she touched with just a little note that was in there, that little prayer, and somebody pulled them up, you know, up over them when they had cancer or sickness or something. Man, what a comfort that it was. But she was a great mom, a great friend. I know she's going to be missed. I miss her already. But uh, on behalf of the church family, we just want to say we grieve with you, but we celebrate. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to say anything? No pressure. I'm, I'm not even going to look at any one particular person. <laughs> no, I'll do it. I'll break the ice. was a tough woman what, who said a mountaineer I've never heard of that one but she was a she was a tough woman you never wanted her mad at you I'll tell you that um, we were gonna get married and man she was so excited and I remember talking with her she was so tough that she didn't want to get pushed or anything like that and it was always exciting to talk to her about physical therapy she'd always say how good she was doing how she could stand up 
by herself. And I remember a story. So we're from Utah. Bunch of Mormons, we have multiple wives, it's usually how it goes. Um, and different religion, right? Born from different, I don't have multiple wives, just one. Just get married one. Um, um, I remember talking to her, because it was two different religions, we believed in something different, we were Mormon, and I, I just remember talking to Mamaw, I was like, Mamaw, am I going to hell? Because I believe in something different? And I just remember her looking at me just like, because we believe something different. And she's like, do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior? I was like, well, yeah. She's like, well, I think you're good. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, uh, that was really nice. And I remember uh, um, picking blueberries with her. And I, I feel like a lot of my success, I actually you know, attribute to her because sun up sun down she would just consistently work and i remember picking blueberries she's oh 50 i don't she never i never knew her age she was always 36 34 um, but we'd pick blueberries and you know i'd start picking and i'd look over and hers was always fuller and I just didn't understand. I felt like she had like a cheat code or something because hers would always fill up faster than mine and she would just say like two or three. And no, it was a great time. And another memory is actually with Charles. And this is when she got mad. You never wanted her to get mad. But poison ivy, we don't have that in Utah. Well, I decided to go get in poison ivy and a bee sting also. Well, um, we're from Utah. We didn't really see tobacco. And I remember putting it on me, and I just remember freaking out. And Mamma just kept calming me, and I, she put me in the tub. I had tobacco on me. She's yelling at me. I'm like 10 years old, freaking out, thinking I'm going to hell because I got tobacco on me. And it's, uh, it's always a, a good, fond. She'll she'll calm me down really quick just by her voice. Yes saying your whole name nine times will usually calm you down and she was great you know i remember just talking with her she she just loved i don't know she just loved that's a, a good way to put it is she was a tough love that's a, a good a good and you know mamma I, I can't say enough positive things like she is just a amazing woman tough woman and Every time you were down here, you never sat, you worked. Yeah. And that was, you know, I felt like carved who I am today. And snakes, we didn't like snakes together. And I would come down and tell her stories, and I'd tell her to go get it. And <laughs> she was just awesome. And so hopefully I can break the ice, and I'll call on Andrew to actually come up here. <laughs> but, okay. I didn't know you'd do that. <laughs> Sorry. say something since I am Mamaw's favorite grandson. Um, Whatever he says after this is a lie. <laughs> um, Mamaw is uh, a big um, impact in my life. Kind of, you know, uh, I'm Joan's brother, so I'm, we're from Utah. Even though we, you know, we're separated by, you know, three thousand miles, um, 
every holiday, every birthday. You know, she she let you know she was thinking about you. Um, she loved her grandkids. She loved her kids, friends and family. Um, it's it's funny because uh, we'd come out here, you know, every couple of years, and when we'd come here, it would be like a second home to us. Um, Mary, you know, she's like family. But, you know, we could be sitting in Utah and say Mary, and we'd all know who we're talking about. <laughs> and even though we didn't get to spend a lot of time out here, uh, the moments we had with Mamaw and Papa are forever impacted on us. Um, from from the work ethic to the compassion, uh, it's been instilled on us. Uh, you know, to answer your question about the blueberries, John, is because she just picked them and you just sat around on the ground <laughs> looking at them. <laughs> I don't remember that. She got a key code. Yeah, so it would be two to three gallons for, you know, one gallon that we picked. She she was a hustler. Um, Memo was worrisome. She'd worry and worry and worry. And uh, I'll tell a little story uh, about Memo and Papa. Um, I came out here, I had to be probably about 12 years old, and Mamaw went into town running some errands, and me and Papaw stayed home, and we were working on some stuff, and Papaw put me on the little John Deere tractor, um, messing around, learning how to use equipment and stuff like that, while he went and took a nap. <laughs> and, uh, would you have it, I'm messing around on the tractor and uh, she comes home and sees me out there by myself and uh, she she asked me now what are you doing I I told you Papa had to be out here I said well Papa told me to do this and he was gonna go take a nap and she said I, I don't want to hear it I don't want to hear it park it and I'm like but Mamma, Papa said it's okay I don't want to hear it just park it <laughs> And when you know, if she has to ask you more than twice, she better run. <laughs> and uh, you know, her her worrisome um, is reflected on you know my everyday of just looking out for the people you care for and making sure that they're not gonna flip the tractor over and yeah. crush it. Um, we miss her. Sweet lady. I could not say enough good things about her. Um, say those things. You knew that was coming. I knew it was. <laughs> You're supposed to call on someone else. <laughs> oh, so as I was down there thinking about what I could say about my mom, there is, there is, there is, both of them were talking about how much they got in trouble, and I can honestly say I never got in trouble with her. She always loved talking to me. Um, and I just, that's so true, though. I just, I can't think of a memory where she got upset with me, and I loved it. And, but I also know I was also scared of talking to her, too. But looking at her photos on the table, it just brings back memories of coming here. And I remember the first time ever meeting Mamma, memory-wise. She came out and saw us out in uh, Ivins, Utah. And I just remember, who is this lady? I don't, I don't know her. She's so weird. And, <laughs> and I was just like, this is this, this, who is this person? And she was the most abnormal person I ever met, I, but it was the memory that stuck with me the most is when she just sat down with you and she just smiled and she's like I'm so happy to be here I am so happy to be here and just 
everything about it, just the memories. And I remember Papa going into the back to smoke, and I was just like, what is he doing? <laughs> I've never seen anyone smoke before. And Mamma was like, he's having his little breaks. And I'm like, okay, fun. <laughs> and I just, when, I remember the first time ever, ever coming out here and just being so excited to go outside of Utah and but also going back to where I knew I was born and being out here just every time I come out here I just love it it's a part of me and part of who I am and the memories that I have with her so I remember my brother's got a ride on she put you to work I remember coming out here after I graduated high school and I spent, and my mom didn't let me sit inside. She's like, go work somewhere. And so I would, I came over to this neighbor's yard, and I put hay on the yard and for the seating. And she's like, no, you're not done yet. You have to go back out. I was like, well, I did what I need to. She's like, nope, you're going to go do something else. And she went to go pick, I went to go pick blueberries, or I went to do something else. And just like, she did not let you sit down. And I love that. It, was, it gave so much of a passion of, like, coming out here and being a part of it. It's remarkable. And the memories you have of her just laughing, talking about the passion she's had in her lives. Um, it was amazing. Um, and I remember, it was actually three days before she passed, I remember calling her and talking to her about John's wedding. And I was like, man, we're, ma'am, I'm really, really excited to go see you when you come up for, ma- um, for John's wedding. She's like, I'm, I'm more, than, more than excited. I just floor to come see everyone be out there for a couple weeks to just spend time with everyone getting to know everyone more and I just that just blows my mind that she just loved everyone so much and how every time I would call her I was like what have you been doing? She's like I'm making quilts and never stop. I was like you're so amazing. The service she does for people I mean, that's something that I think ingrained all of us hall boys is that the service that she's done definitely came to my dad. He's constantly learned that from his mom. And I think that's something that's instilled in our lives is to serve others without reward. And I think that's something that I'll continually learn from and I'll be an example of from her is to be able to be an example and to be able to care, but also give service to those that need it. So that's it. Awesome. All right, so thank you for those words and sentiments. And if if you're one of the ones who public speaking is not necessarily your favorite thing, then Damon. obviously <laughs> just uh, <laughs> a quick prayer saying, God, give my mom, give my aunt, give my mamma an extra special hug. That, that'll be great. Now, there's one remaining part of the ceremony. You can see the plants that are all around. Um, these hydrangeas came from uh, the second largest nursery in the country. Uh, found out that uh, mom had passed and donated these hydrangeas for this particular service. But there's there's a tree that you see recently planted just to the left, or your, your left, my right, right here. And it's a Sweet Bay Magnolia. Now magnolias, uh, were one of mom's favorite trees, and particularly this particular variety, um, Magnolia virginiana. Okay, occupational hazard there, sorry. But it's the um, Magnolia trees for centuries have been very popular across all, um, basically around the world. There's not really a, a part of the world which the magnolia is really known for. And it's very popular here in the United States. It's the state, flower, uh, state tree of Mississippi, state flower of Louisiana. And this particular magnolia, the blooms, we could be standing clear over here and you would smell the fragrance from this sweet bay magnolia. So yesterday, those same three guys that you saw here <laughs> planted that tree right there and dedicating it to mom and there's actually a few of mom's the ashes from her urn that are in the bottom of the hole to kind of signify the tie to this land that you referred to Sonny 
And of course, horticulturally, it makes a lot of sense because there's a lot of calcium phosphate in ashes, and that's good for root development within the tree. Again, sorry, occupational hazard there. But that tree is going to grow faster and stronger because it has its roots in a piece of mom. Right? Just like we have grown up stronger, taller, mostly <laughs> stronger, wiser, because our roots are also in mom. So it's that, that tree there, it'll be no. We put it in the gap between the, the trees and the fence so anybody that comes by will see the tree and certainly they'll smell the fragrance. So that fragrance is, is so sweet and that's the fragrance that mom left for us, that sweet <coughs> smell. But now mom has a new home, yeah. one that is quite literally paradise. She and dad worked hard making this, this place look the way that it does and he, it's not even the way it looks in the heyday because as they age you, know, you had to pull it back and so forth and just manage a piece of it but the home that she and dad are in now with vibrant colors that even we in our finite minds can't even ascertain the colors that we will see the vibrancy of that paradise and truly all is well with mom. All is well. No more pain. No more worries. Right? No more worries. She didn't have to worry anymore. Because she is truly in paradise. All is well. All is well. All is well. And so that there just happens to be a hymn that is all is well. And I want to go back to the, the Southern Gospel Quartet version of All Is Well, and that's going to be the close of our ceremony. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea your life they may remember some of what you said and if you're lucky they may even remember some of what you did but they will always remember how you made them feel 
Thank you, Mom, for making us feel loved and serving us so well. So that's the end of our uh, formal ceremony. We're going to move into a time of refreshments. So I'm giving a, a heads up to Angie and the crew. and They need a little bit of time in order to get things ready for us. So I have an activity for us. For the next three minutes, you have... You're, you may be sitting with people that you know at your respective tables. You may not. But each table over the next three minutes has to decide on a word that describes Christine. A word. And then you got three minutes. I'll debrief that real quick. I'll pray over the food and we'll start telling some stories about mom. But you got three minutes. Now that's... What? You've been, you, some of you don't know each other. You you now have a chance to meet your new best friends, right? If you want to join tables, that's fine too, Cynthia. You can join a different table, but come up with one word, one word that describes Christine, and then I'll come around. Begin. I didn't know her. Love her. She's loving till she's not. Well, she's loving all the time. She's loving even when she's not loving. What's up, Dustin? What's up? You guys gonna think of a word to help us? Endearing. That's a good one. This is Macy's Dustin. Hi, Nice to meet you. Hey, I'm Summer. Summer, I'm Macy. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Endearing. I kind of like that one. Oh, no, it's pretty good. <laughs> pretty good. Pretty good. Can I take you both? Two more minutes. <laughs> it looks like they're taking a break or something. I don't know. Yesterday. <laughs> Where did they go? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, we're going to stay here. We're going to get some lunch here. Like yeah, I have a hose. Endearing. I think I like Dustin's work. You're going to see some more. Tell us over there. We have been riding. We've been riding. Mom! Mom! Actually, we have a In the way of a shuttle. I 40 was blocked, so we had to take like 240 all the way out. Yeah, we had a sign that said I 40. Mom! We're going to take a break. Why don't you go with the kids? I tried following you because we pulled up and saw Look, they're playing right in the way of the shuttle. No. One more minute. <laughs> 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 All right, let me let me debrief. All right, finish that thought, and we're going to start over here at this table. What was the one word that y'all came up with to describe Christine? Love. Love. That's a great word. Thank you very much. In this table. Mom said, Mom said precious. Precious. That's awesome. And dear, as Sunny. Yeah. Right here. Endearing. 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 All right. That's awesome. Ready? Y'all's table. Resilient. Resilient. I love that one. 
Did y'all happen to have one? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, what is it? Well, our association uh, is only for you, so we came up with long suffering. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> hey, Cynthia, did you? What's a word? Peacemaker. Oh yeah, that's crazy. All right, Brandy, your table. I am listening. Loving. All right, and then the Trish table. Fierce. 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 Oh my word, that's a great word. Fierce. That's well done. All right, Kate, your table. Incredible. Incredible. Oh, I love it. I words are always good. And then the back corner. Did y'all come up with a Kyle? The best? I think it's two words. <laughs> the best. Well, that, that is two words. But we are in the South, and everything's two syllables in the South, even if it's one word. So, all right. And there's, there's any, uh, yeah? Lots, oh, yeah, lots of blue people. Okay, awesome. Did, did any other names come up? All right, so y'all y'all passed the project. You did a good job, and I've stalled long enough. The food is ready, so let me bless it for us, and we'll, we'll go table by table. Heavenly Father, thank you again for Christine and what she meant to us. Thank you for this time to come together with kindred hearts and to celebrate what she meant to us. Thank you that you are a, a loving and a merciful God who has only the best in store for us. Though those may be good times, those may be bad times. All things work for the good of those who love you and call according to your purpose. So as we partake of this food, we pray that you would bless it and nourish our bodies. That we would gain strength from it. That we would serve the world with great passion to the glory and honor of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you all very much. Those of you who can't stay, the, the shuttles are here. They're going to be running back and forth between now and, and 3 p.m. But I would invite you to make your way through the awning there. There's some refreshments. You can go on both sides and then come back to the tables and enjoy the lack of rain that we've had. All right, thank you.